Welcome back. In the second part of this lecture, we'll begin by talking about three special identities called the Pythagorean identities. First, before we talk about using them or explaining why they're true, just a little note about notation here. You'll notice I have something written like this, sine with a little squared and theta. And for trigonometry, this is the way that we are going to indicate powers of a trig function by putting the power between the name of the trig function and the input. So when I write sine with a little squared theta, what that really means is taking sine of theta, that entire trig function's output, and then squaring it. Similarly, if you were to write sine cubed theta, that would mean taking sine of theta and then cubing it. If I didn't have the square there, if I had the square here, sine theta squared, then this squared would be only squaring the angle. This would be something where I am taking theta, squaring it, and using it as the input for my trig function, as opposed to sine squared of theta, where theta is the input, I find what sine of theta is, and then I square that result. So these trigonometric identities basically allow us to use this identity to create a relationship between sine and cosine, between cosecant and cotangent, between tangent and secant. So for example, if you know what sine is, you can use the first identity to find out what cosine should be. Or if you know cotangent, you can use the second identity to find out what cosecant is. And then similarly, if you know tangent, you can use the other identity to find out what secant is. Now, to show why this is true, probably not a big surprise if it's called the Pythagorean identities that the Pythagorean theorem would fit into this somewhere. So we'll start by drawing ourselves a right triangle whose sides are opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse. And the one thing that we know, of course, is from the Pythagorean theorem that the opposite squared plus the adjacent squared should be equal to the hypotenuse squared. I'm just going to label that as equation number one. So if I take equation number one and if I divide everybody by hypotenuse squared, I would get opposite squared over hypotenuse squared. I would get adjacent squared over hypotenuse squared. I would get hypotenuse squared over hypotenuse squared. And if I simplify this, on the right side, hypotenuse squared over hypotenuse squared, that's just one. We know that opposite over hypotenuse is sine of theta. So if you have it squared, that should be sine squared of theta. Adjacent over hypotenuse is cosine, so adjacent squared over hypotenuse squared should be cosine squared theta. So as you can see, this first identity that we have turns out to just be a consequence of the Pythagorean theorem. We started with the Pythagorean theorem, I divided everybody by, co by hypotenuse squared, and I ended up with my first Pythagorean identity. And I'm going to do similar sorts of things to get the other two identities. So again, I'm going to start for the next identity with my equation number one, which was opposite squared plus adjacent squared equals hypotenuse squared. And so the first time I divided everybody by hypotenuse squared, this time I'll divide everybody by adjacent squared. And then what do I have? I have opposite over adjacent. We know that that's tangent. So opposite squared over adjacent squared, that's tangent squared theta. Adjacent over adjacent is just 1, and so adjacent squared over adjacent squared is also 1. And if we remember our trig ratios, hypotenuse over adjacent, that that is secant, so hypotenuse squared over adjacent squared, that is secant squared. And there we go, there's our second of the identities. 
And again, if we start with our first equation, but this time divide everybody by, instead of hypotenuse squared or adjacent squared, divide everybody by opposite squared. Then we'll have one adjacent over opposite that is a cotangent. So adjacent squared over opposite squared is cotangent squared theta. Hypotenuse over opposite, that is cosecant. So hypotenuse squared over opposite squared, that's cosecant squared. And there we go. We've got our third trigonometric identity. One thing that maybe you noticed or maybe you haven't or wondered about is remember that when we're dividing by anything, we always have to wonder, is it possible that we might be dividing by zero? And we don't have to worry about that here because, of course, you know that if we're talking about a triangle, these side lengths, none of them could be zero. So I don't have to worry about dividing by zero here. Hypotenuse certainly is not zero. Or dividing by zero here, the adjacent side is not zero. Or dividing by zero here, the opposite side is not zero. So I don't have to worry about this ever being undefined. If we're talking about right triangle trig, these three identities will always hold for any angle between zero and 90. We're also going to see that, except for the places where these trig functions are undefined, these identities will also hold for other angles as well, but we'll see that in the future. So this is an example of where the right triangle trig, uh, the Pythagorean identity, can be useful for us. If you wanted to, you could solve this problem kind of in the same way that we did the one in the previous video. First by drawing yourself a right triangle, and then saying that since sine of theta is two-fifths, and you know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, that the opposite side must measure 2 and the hypotenuse must measure 5. And then you can use the Pythagorean theorem to find out what the adjacent side is and then use that to find cosine of theta. That's one way that you can solve the problem. However, the other way that we can solve the problem is that we know that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. And we know what sine of theta is, that's 2 fifths. So 2 fifths squared plus cosine squared theta is equal to 1. And then now it's just a matter of solving for cosine of theta. And if I bring that 4 25ths to the other side, I'll have cosine of theta is 21 25ths. Cosine squared theta, rather, is 21 25ths. And so cosine of theta would be square root of that. Now, one thing that I didn't do here, and you might be wondering what about, is this. We had cosine squared was 21 25ths. And so when I took square root, why didn't I take plus or minus? Hopefully you were wondering that question, why didn't I take plus or minus? And the reason is, here I don't have to take plus or minus, because one thing that we know is we're talking about an angle that's in a right triangle, and if you're in a right triangle, you know that cosine of theta would be adjacent over hypotenuse, and in a right triangle, adjacent would be a positive number, and hypotenuse would be a positive number, which means cosine of theta should be a positive number. So this is why I knew I didn't need to do plus or minus, because if we're talking about trig in a right triangle, all of these trig functions will only have positive values. That won't be true in the future when we talk about trig functions in general. Sometimes they'll be positive, sometimes they'll be negative. But one of the advantages to right angle trigonometry is that because you're only talking about angles inside of a right triangle, then you know that those side lengths must all be positive values, which means that all of your trig functions will all be positive. So there was no need to take plus or minus the square root because we knew that the minus 
wouldn't have been possible. So only the positive root. So our answer then, root of 21 over 5. All right, so the business with co-functions comes up here. Remember that co-functions are the two functions are similar in name, except one of them has a co in front. So, for example, cosine is the co-function of sine. Cotangent is the co-function of tangent. Cosecant is the co-function of secant. Now, we have this lovely angle theorem here, the complementary angle theorem. Complementary angles are, are angles that add up to 90 degrees. And if you're talking about a right triangle, because the three angles all together add up to 180, and since you have a 90 degree angle already there, then the other two angles must always add up to 90 degrees. So for any right triangle, the other two, tri the other two angles are complementary angles. So here in my little diagram, I have angle alpha and angle beta, and both of those are complementary angles. The complementary angle theorem says that if you have complementary angles, then the cofunctions of those complementary angles are equal. So for example, if you're talking about sine and cosine, sine of one angle and cosine of the other will be equal to each other. Sine of alpha and cosine of beta would be equal. And the reason for that you can see directly from the triangle. If you're looking at what is sine of alpha, that would be opposite over hypotenuse. And if you're looking at cosine of beta, cosine of beta is adjacent over hypotenuse, and they're both the same. They're both b over hypotenuse. It would also be true for sine of alpha is equal to cos of beta, but also true to say that sine of beta is equal to cos of alpha for basically the same reason. And you also have a similar relationship between secant and cosecant. Secant of one angle is cosecant of the other. And similarly for tangent, tangent of one angle is cotangent of the other. So even though we don't know how to evaluate these individual trig functions yet, so although you might not know what is secant of 15 degrees or what sine of pi over 6, we actually will be able to use the theorem to evaluate these. I'll do B first and then do A after. I'm going to do B first because that's in degrees, which is probably easier for everyone involved. And so if you notice here that the two angles that we're looking at, 75 and 15 degrees, that those are indeed complementary angles. They do add up to 90 degrees, which means that if you're looking at cosecant of 75, that that's the same thing as secant of 15. So when you say cosecant of 75 over secant of 15, that's the same thing as secant of 15 over secant of 15, and even though we don't know what secant of 15 is, that's equal to 1. For the second one, this is going to take just a little moment on the side if we're thinking just in terms of degrees to uh, radians to degrees, you can calculate and find out that pi over 3 radians is the same thing as 60 degrees, and that pi over 6 radians is the same thing as 30 degrees. So actually here, when we're talking about cosine of pi over 3 and sine of pi over 6, we are talking about complementary angles. So cosine of pi over 3 is the same thing as sine of pi over 6. So cosine of pi over 3 is the same thing as sine of pi over 6. So what we actually have is equivalent to sine of pi over 6 divided by uh, minus sine of pi over 6, which is 0. So even though we don't know yet what is sine of pi over 6, we can find out that 
that sine of pi over 6 minus sine of pi over 6 is 0. So using our complementary angle theorem, we were actually able to evaluate both of these. One of these was equal to 0, and the other one was equal to 1. Next, uh, for finding approximate values with your calculator, and this is something where you'll want to take a look at the video that I've created for evaluating trig functions with your calculator, if you want to see that in, in more detail. But on our calculator, the sharp that we're working with, you'll see that there are a couple of things to note. The first, namely, that for our calculator, there are three different ways that it measures angles degrees, radians, and the third kind of angle measurement called gradients, which we are not using. And you can tell which your calculator is using by what it says at the very top. So here you can see on my little image that I've got of a calculator, it says DEG, so that's telling you that your calculator is measuring angles in terms of degrees. If you want to change it, to another kind of angle measurement, that's what this button, DRG, is used for. So if you touch it once, it'll now change it to radians, touch it again, and it will change it to gradians. So depending on whether it says degrees at the top, or radians at the top, or gradians at the top, that's how you'll know whether your angle is being measured in terms of degrees, radians, or gradients. And that's what the DRG stands for, for that button, changing from degrees to radians to gradients. So that's the first caution. If you're using your calculator, make sure you have your calculator set for the right kind of angle. The second thing to note here is that we only have three trig functions on our calculator, sine, cosine, and tangent. So that means that if you wanted, for example, to find out what is secant of 12 degrees, you would have to rewrite that as the reciprocal of cosine of 12 degrees. So you would have to run that through your calculator as 1 divided by cosine of 12 degrees. The one thing to be careful about here, and this is something that people will see on their calculator and maybe misinterpret, would be these little functions that we have up top where we have things like a sine with a minus one and a cosine with a minus one and a tangent with a minus one. Um, a lot of people will interpret that as meaning reciprocal, but that is not what we mean here. The little minus one is actually referring to the inverse, the inverse of the sine function, the inverse of the cosine function, and the inverse of the tangent function. And we will talk about that much later, um, so we will get to inverse trig functions at some point. But just to be aware that these three, the sine with the minus one, cosine with the minus one, and tangent with the minus one, those are not giving you reciprocals. So you would not use those to find secant, cosecant, and cotangent. Those would give you inverse trig functions, which are something completely different. So if you are entering things in, the only other thing that you'll need to know, of course, is the location of pi. If you're doing anything involving uh, a radian measurement, you'll see that pi happens to live over there. So just as an example, if you're running things through your calculator, if you wanted to enter in what is cosine of 2 pi over 3, you would first have to, number one, Touch the DRG button until your calculator says radians rather than degrees. And once it's done that, then you would have to enter your cosine of 2 pi over 3 by entering cosine bracket 2 times pi divided by 3 bracket equals. And it will then tell you your answer. All right, so let's continue on with these. Um, so for these three, and if you want to see me working them by hand, you can see these three examples done exactly in that calculator video that I've got. So when I entered sine of 23 degrees, making sure my calculator was in degrees mode, then entering in sine of 23, then I find that for sine of 23 degrees, so sine 
two, three, and then hit equals. And rounding off to three decimal places, it was 0 0.3907, so that's about 0 0.391. And then similarly here, I want to do now in radians cosine of 2 pi over 5. So for that, I, when I enter that in my calculator, I enter cosine left bracket 2 times pi divided by 5 right bracket. And then when I ran that through my calculator, of course, making sure that your calculator is in radians mode first. So making sure that we're in radians mode and then entering in cosine left bracket 2 times pi divided by 5. And then right bracket, and that gives you point. 309016, so about 0 0.309. And then lastly, cotangent. This is now in degrees, so we're going to need to go back to degrees mode. So again, touching your calculator until it says DEG at the top, degrees. And this is where we need to remind ourselves that we don't have a button for cotangent that we need to use the fact that tangent is the reciprocal of cotangent. So when I enter this through my calculator, I would enter in as 1 divided by tangent 81 and then equals. So 1 divided by tangent of 81 degrees. And then when I hit equals, after I find that out, I'll know the, the value of cotangent of 81 degrees is about 0.1583, so about 0.158. Now, one thing I do want to caution us about here is that although we are going to sometimes need to find approximate values for trig functions and that would be for things like application questions where you're looking for you know how tall is the building sort of a thing that would be a reason why you might round things off to a, a certain number of decimal places but as always unless I'm telling you that I want you to round your answer off then that means I would want an uh, exact answer instead so when I say later on find the value of sine of 45 degrees. I'm not interested in what your calculator has to tell me. I would be interested in the exact value. But there may be a few application questions where I say, solve this problem and round your answer off to a certain number of decimals, in which case, go right ahead and use your calculator to find the approximate values. And so we are going to see a couple of applications here. So the first would be things where we are looking and there is an angle of either elevation or angle of depression. So when we're talking about an angle of elevation, that's me looking up at some object. So this is my line of sight looking at some object. And the angle of elevation is the angle that my line of sight makes with the horizon, with the horizontal. So that angle would be my angle of elevation looking up at some object. And then there's also the equivalent where if you are maybe looking down at some object, and then the angle your eyesight makes with the horizontal, that would be the angle of depression. So the angle of elevation, you're looking up. The angle of depression, you are looking down at some object. Okay, so let's tackle this first problem here. I'm standing 20 meters away from a building, and if I look at the top of the building, the angle of elevation is 12 degrees, uh, 72 degrees, rather. So I'm going to draw, here's the ground, and let's say here's where I am, and here's where the building is, and I know that that distance is 20 meters, and this is my building. And when I look up at that building, 
So that's my what I've drawn here, this little line. This is my line of sight. The angle of elevation, the angle my line of sight makes with the horizontal, is 72 degrees. And we're assuming, of course, this building is not tilted, that it's standing straight up, so it's a right triangle. It's a 90 degrees with the ground. And what we're interested in is this. This would be the height of the building, would be X. This other measurement, Y, this is not something that I would be needing. This would be the distance from my eyes to the top of the building in a straight line. And, and I'm not interested in that. That's not telling me anything meaningful. I want to know how tall is the building. And this is my building, so X is the height of that building. So if we're thinking about the triangle that we have here, we have, for 72 degrees, the adjacent side. It measures 20 meters. We are interested in X, which is the opposite side. And so if we're thinking about trig functions that involve opposites and adjacents, that would either be tangent or cotangent. We know that tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. That means that for this particular case, that tangent of 72 degrees would be our opposite side, x, divided by our adjacent side, which is 20 meters. And so now I just need to solve for x by bringing that 20 up to the other side. I'll have 20 times tangent of 72 degrees. And then now I just need to calculate that. Now one little caution that I do want to make here, and this is a mistake that a lot of people will make, and I will just do this on the side, would be that sometimes people will think that when we have tangent of 72 multiplied by 20, that the 72 and the 20 can be multiplied, and that somehow this will turn into tangent of 1,440. Uh, except that is not the case. Because again, reminder that when we're talking about tangent or any other trig function, 72 is the input that is going into that tangent function. It's not 72 multiplied by tangent, which is why we can't multiply the 20 and the 72 together. Tangent of 72 is one single thing, and that whole thing is multiplied by 20. So when I calculate it, it's not tangent of 1440, it is 20 times tangent of 72. Now this is an example of me needing to find the approximate value because it does say here that I want to round my height, the answer off to one decimal place. So this is something where we would want to know, know with our calculator what is 20 times tangent of 72. And so, again, using your calculator, making sure it's in degrees mode, because we're talking about tangent of 72 degrees. And then running this through your calculator, you'll find that x is approximately 61.55 or 61.6. .6. So that means the building is about 61.6 meters tall. Nice. All right. Let's do one last example here. So here I want to find the approximate value of x. And if we're looking at our diagram, x is not the entire length of the bottom of this triangle. x is just this little length that we have here going from this one point to the other. Now. If you're thinking a little bit cleverly here, this is sort of like a triangle within a triangle. We have one small triangle where the angle is 70 degrees and the side length is 10. And then we've got the larger triangle on the outside where the side length is 10 and the angle is 32 degrees. So if you were to take this entire length, I'm going to call this length A, and I'm going to call this length B. A is just this distance, 
and b is all of this distance. If you wanted to know what is x, what is this amount, I could find that by taking all of b, this full distance, and subtracting a. So that's kind of my plan here. I'm going to find x by first finding b and then subtracting a. And this is something where, again, if you're looking at what I've got, I'm going to make this look a little bit nicer. If you're looking at what I've got, I have got two right triangles. And for the two right triangles, I happen to know one angle and one side. So this is actually kind of similar to what we did with the building problem. So, for example, for this, if you're looking at what is B, you can say, well, we know that we've got an angle. We have the opposite side is 10, and we're looking for the adjacent side, which is B. That's the mystery unknown. So one thing that we do know is that tangent of 32 degrees should be opposite over adjacent, or 10 over b, which if you were to do a little bit of algebraic manipulation, you could find what b is, and b is 10 divided by tangent of 32 degrees. And then you could do a similar sort of thing for the smaller triangle. You could say, well, much in that same sort of a, of a way of dealing with it, we have the angle 70 degrees, we have the adjacent side, we have the uh, opposite side of 10, and so uh, we know that tangent of 70 is opposite over adjacent, or 10 divided by A, and so there we go, we can do much the same thing that we did before and say that A should be 10 divided by tangent of 70 degrees. And then I can figure out what both of these are individually if I want to, or I can then say, well, X is supposed to be equal to B minus A, and B was 10 over tangent of 32 degrees, and A was 10 over tangent of 70 degrees, and then the only thing left for me to do is then run that through my calculator. So then I just need to calculate 10 divided by tangent of 32 degrees minus 10 divided by tangent of 70 degrees, and then what do I get? I get 12.363 about, so approximately 12.3 four units. So the measurement for x is about 12.4.